Welcome to Biohacking with Brittany. Thank you for tuning in this week to another episode. I'm your host, Brittany Ford, and I am a registered holistic nutritionist, and I specialize in functional medicine and women's health and biohacking, of course. This episode is really cool. We dive into gene therapy, and this is something that I really did not know a lot about before getting into this with Elizabeth. And it was so fascinating learning about her story and how she got to this point of creating a company that specializes in gene therapy and what gene therapy can really do for our health, our health span, our lifespan, and all of the different implications that can come in the future years. So This is a very, very interesting episode all about bioengineering and biotechnology and very future thinking, which I love. So we talk a lot about what exactly is gene therapy, what is regenerative medicine, how can we extend a health span versus lifespan, and she kind of gives some recommendations for that. Although we've talked about that a lot on the show, and there's way more that we can go into in terms of lifestyle habits and nutrition. So you can refer to other episodes for more information on that type of thing. And then we get into her experience with gene therapy and how she risked her own health and life to try it and what her experience was and how how she's feeling now and how her biomarkers have changed. And it's very interesting just to hear kind of everything that she goes through. And yeah, I think you're going to learn a lot from this about just human longevity in general. So before we dive in, a shout out to Inside Tracker. Speaking of biomarkers, if you want to get your biomarkers checked, I would do it through Inside Tracker. It's a blood test that comes to your house. And they actually have a great promo going on for Black Friday. So definitely check it out. It's one of the cheapest times that you can buy it. And you can use my discount code Biohacking Brittany in all capitals. And that will get you the most discount you can possibly get. So I definitely recommend doing that if you want to get like your hormones, minerals, vitamins checked. And a shout out to Fatty15. This is such a revolutionary product. Fatty15 is based on the new fatty acid C15. And this is the first essential fatty acid that has been found over 90 years and over 90 years since omega-3. However, it is three times more powerful. So I actually, which is so interesting, I need to tell the team at Fatty15, I actually had somebody in my DM say, omega-3 gave me headaches and it dropped my HRV and it increased my heart rate. And I, for whatever reason, like I could not take any types of omega-3. And then I started taking Fatty15 after I saw your recommendation and my HRV is great. My heart rate is great and I have no symptoms. So I was so excited to hear that because I don't think those are common reactions to omega-3. And so I'm so happy that she was able to find an alternative that actually works better. So definitely check out Fatty15. You can go and get a discount through the link in my website and in my show notes. There's no discount code for them, but it is all linked everywhere. And also if it's hard for you to find, which I doubt it, you can message me on Instagram and I will send it to you. Also check out my new website. I'm so proud of it. I've gotten such good feedback actually. I've, you know, multiple people have sent me messages being like, wow, this looks beautiful. Like way to go. So I'm so happy about it. I'm taking all the small wins I can get in life. Okay. Enjoy this podcast episode. I'm not going to keep you from the episode any longer. And I will catch you on Friday for another one that is more focused on women's health. And these Tuesday ones are more focused on biohacking in general. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe, leave a rating, a review, whatever you would like to do. And I would really appreciate that. And I will catch you on Friday for another episode. Well, welcome to Biohacking with Brittany. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. We are doing a deep dive into gene therapy, which is something that I don't think I have explored yet on my podcast. And I'm excited to dive into it with Elizabeth Parrish, who is a remarkable figure at the forefront of regenerative medicine and gene therapy. She is a humanitarian, an entrepreneur, an innovator, author, and advocate for genetic cures. And she has dedicated her life 
sounds like, to healthy human longevity. And I just found out she actually doesn't live that far away. So Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Before we dive into like the science and the gene therapy and everything, how long have you lived in kind of like a remote area of where you are right now? Let me see. So I grew up pretty remotely. I had a horse and that's some indication of that. And then I spent uh, almost 20 years in Seattle, Washington. And then I moved to outside of uh, Seattle, Washington, probably for the last 15. And, you know, I think that living remotely actually for me is uh, super beneficial. Just health wise, or why do you think? Well, I'm super connected with nature. So if you see my yard, I mean, I'm not going to say it looks great, but I garden. I often garden between meetings. I think that my connection with animals and nature, my house is always surrounded by birds and dogs and cats, some of them my own, some of them not. And I don't know, it just, to me, it's, I like living in the phylogenic grocery store of genetics. Oh, I love that. I love that. Yeah, I think there's something to be said about living a more rural life and being closer to nature and further from, you know, pollution and traffic and a lot of people and even noise pollution as well. So I'm, I just ask because my husband and I are considering relocating right now and we're kind of all over the map. So it's always interesting to hear kind of what people's take is. Yeah, I, I think that I would even like to live farther out. I, I just absolutely love it. And, you know, the the most that I do that would make that difficult is I travel a lot. So I travel all over the world talking about gene therapy and patient advocacy. And so some sort of proximity to an airport is important. But, you know, a lot of the rural towns have shuttles and fabulous scenery around here. You live in a beautiful place and really you're quite sister to me. In some places near where I live, I can look over uh, towards you and you can look towards me. So we love where we live and it's connection. I love that. I love that. So how did you, what was your transition from the previous work that you were doing in your career to kind of looking into gene therapy and then you ended up starting a company in this space? Like Can you kind of walk us through what that looked like for you and your experience? Yeah, I'm I'm pretty unlikely suspect to be here. And what I really love about my story, even though, you know, I mean, it's quite boring to me, is that, you know, I'm probably the best evidence that anyone listening to this that thinks that they can't make a difference in the world, I am going to make you feel like you can. So my story is very basic. My early studies in science were never even fully finished. I was I was taking a a bachelor's in biology and I left school in order to have my second child. And let's see, some years after he was born, I was brought on to a project for regenerative medicine and the advocacy of the use of stem cells. It was an educational program. I think that was 2011. And I worked on that for a couple of years, but that came to a screeching halt when in 2013, he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, my second child was. And so my story really starts in being a parent, being a mother, and having a child that's a patient in a world in which I was actually educated on what the up-and-coming technology was. And the technology that even to this day that I studied, what, some over 10 years ago, vastly has not reached patients. And so my story in the area of genetics started in that, in the education process of the use of stem cells and falling in love with the genetics behind them. And then having my son diagnosed and looking for what was available in genetics or stem cells to save his life. And I mean, he has a treatable condition, but he, you can die from type one at any point. And I also was becoming an advocate for all the children that I had met in children's hospital. I mean, really, you know, all of us would be shocked. You know, we, we live in, in a world in which we're born and we almost think that we are flat out given some 80 some years of general health and then we're going to die. But the truth is that even people who get those 80 some years live about a third of it in poor health and chronic disease. And there are a bunch of kids that still are becoming ill and and are sick or born with genetic 
monogenic disorders that limits their lifespan significantly. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. So in 2013, I went looking for cures for kids. And by 2015, I launched a company called BioViva, in which every gene that we look at will also treat a childhood disease, but it will also treat biological aging, everyone on the planet. And you'll probably have questions about that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I I think that's so interesting in itself that you only look at genes that support healthy children, but also aging. Like, how did you even figure that out in the first place that there were genes that were capable of doing both of those things? When my son was diagnosed, I started to look towards what I could find in genetic medicine, sort of veering away from stem cells and looking for cures. And one of the conferences that I was uh, interested in going to and actually went to was called Sen6. And it was Aubrey de Grey's conference on biological aging. But the reason I went is because there were a lot of people speaking on genetics. One of them was a professor of genetics at Harvard, George Church, who became a founder of my company. And when I started asking people how biological aging ties in with childhood disease, number one, biological aging is the number one biggest medical unmet need. So if you can actually crack that nut, you have treatments for everyone and you have a mandate. So therefore, you could move more quickly with these technologies. Think about the treat, the COVID vaccine, how fast they moved with that. But number two, some of the diseases in children are that they suffer from are actually accelerated aging, a disease called progeria, in which children die between their teen years and their early 20s is, is accelerated aging. And so from that to uh, muscular dystrophies, uh, to adrenal leukodystrophy and other uh, conditions that are more monogenically based, these were the therapies that could have the biggest impact on both the old and the young. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, aging and longevity is such a hot topic right now. I don't know how many books have come out in the last couple of years about longevity and this idea of health span versus versus lifespan, like especially in the biohacking space and the health optimization space, it's so much about, is about that right now. And like you said, it's such a interesting code to crack because like once you do that, you can help so many people. Do you feel like, and this might be a little controversial, but do you think that there are potentially governments or businesses that maybe don't want you to figure that out? Because what if our population could now live so much longer? And like, what would that mean for the impact on our planet? Actually, increasing uh, health span isn't a problem for society. It actually solves a $38 trillion problem a year. Just slow aging by one year. That's how much uh, we could save here in the United States. And If you could do that by 10 years or 20 years, you're looking at exponential savings. I do know, and we all know that it will disrupt uh, how we do medicine. Right now we have a sick care system. We wait until people get sick. You know, you feel kind of bad. You either go to the ER or you go to your doctor and they give you drugs that treat the symptoms of those conditions. They might give you statins or any number of drugs that might treat the symptoms of your disease. The, the genetic medicine is curative medicine. So we're, you know, some people call it regenerative. I like to call it restorative. What we would be doing is just upregulating genes that make your cells behave youthfully again. And that's why the risk of Alzheimer's and cancer and heart disease and all the things that we vastly die of go up exponentially after the age of 65. It's not just, you know, some sort of magic. It's actually because of cellular aging. And then when we talk about chronological age, which is your years on the planet, how many years you are old versus biological age is the reason why there's outliers, liars. So the outliers are the ones that are, might not start getting sick until they're 85 or 95, or they might be the unfortunate few that get sick at 45 or 50. When we look at childhood disease and we think about curing just a childhood disease in comparison to treating 
all of biological aging problems. We look at maybe taking kids who are very sick, making them healthy, and then they just start dying again from diseases later down the road. So this is very much a shift in the system towards a healthcare system in preventative medicine rather than treating symptoms. So yeah, I mean, it's a disruptive idea. It, it actually disrupts so many different industries that make money off of your sickness that y- you can imagine uh, the impact there. But all of those companies will start shifting towards uh, this new medicine. I think it was Bayer, which is uh, a company in Germany. They said that they had planned now to go all gene and cell by 2030 or something like that. And so you know, the, even the biggest players in the industry are, are starting to make the shift. All right. I know that so many of us struggle with our hormones. We have a lot of confusion around our menstrual cycles, ovulation, having our periods, regulating it, and really just minimizing the symptoms that we often deal with. I have been there. I've had a mild PCOS diagnosis. I have had irregular cycles since I've been off birth control. I've had a ovarian cyst. And honestly, I've been through a lot when it comes to hormones in the last few years. So out of that, I really taught myself about cycle syncing. And this is the idea that during different phases of the cycle, we are doing different things. We are eating different foods, taking different supplements or drinking different teas for the nutrients, exercising differently in response to where our hormones are at at that time. And through living in this ebb and flow of our cycle, we can actually feel better. We can look better. Our hormones are happier. We're mentally better. We can sleep better. And this is exactly what I found. So I took everything that I did. I put it into an easy peasy guide for you. It's called the ebb and flow cycle guide. It's on my website. Go and grab it right now. This is literally going to solve all of your hormone issues. I'm not kidding. It's so, so good. And it's so easy to read as well. I also added in a part about seed cycling because I know so many of you are interested in seed cycling as well. So that means what seeds do we take during which phase of the cycle? These seeds have different phytonutrients in it that can help with the different hormones during the different phases. And I've also included over 30 recipes that are super tasty as a bonus. So these recipes are designed for the different phases. So you can have certain ones during your period, during ovulation and things like that. And of course, I included biohacks. I included which biohacks to do around ovulation to optimize that how to optimize your menstrual cycle or your menstruation during your period and everything like that. Everything from castor oil packs to acupuncture to red light therapy to healing baths that that I love, that is what I did. So this is my ebb and flow cycle guide. You can grab it on my website right now, biohackingbrittany.com. Go for it. And I hope you really enjoy it. There's been over 500 that have been bought already, which is so amazing to see. And I'm just so thankful that I get to help women with their hormones and on their health journey. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I like the idea of working to expand health span and not necessarily lifespan, which I think is important because like you said, like about a third of our life, we spend sick, which is a significant amount. And it's just interesting, but I, I do agree with you. I think it is going to disrupt the pharmaceutical companies, big pharma, like things like that, because again, it's sick care versus healthcare. And if less people are sick, there's less people buying those drugs and they're not going to like that, but we will be happier and healthier. So, (laughs) which is the the more important mission at large here. We'll be too. So those, when those companies actually have the buying power to buy out the companies who are developing these technologies. And that's both fortunate and unfortunate. You know, our goal is to hope you know, hope that these new biotech companies become the new industry leaders. But the way that business was done before, those are run by people who vastly want to live longer and healthier too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a good point. I'm curious if you and your team have a definition of when somebody is sick. So, like what you're previously saying was 
when you get sick in your 70s, or sometimes it happens when you're 40s or your 50s. Like, how would you define an adult who is sick versus someone who is in good health, I guess? I think that's a really interesting question because the goal of our company would to be to keep a body in homeostasis, meaning that it repairs faster than it degrades. So what is cellular aging, but cellular degrading, cells degrading over time, right? And how we might look at disease is quite impending. So you might be pre-diagnosis, but if you're over a certain age, and, and in some people where evidence is there that of the accumulation of damage much earlier in years than we expected, maybe even your early 20s. So I would say that The species has a master disease called biological aging, and it is slowly killing everyone. So there is a difference between becoming an adult, the process of becoming an adult, and the process of the biological aging process. And it's actually happening throughout there. So there's no part of our life that we're not incurring some amount of damage. So if we can repair the damage earlier on, then we would probably have the best success with the medicine. So, you know, my guess is that we'll start using these type of technologies in the terminally ill first to get a safety profile, hope to help them. And then the technology will be worked back almost like an immunization against aging. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty mind blowing if you think about it from that perspective, Because obviously you do want to reverse cellular aging and obviously that is important. But then I also think about just like the preventative measures that we can take and how can we be proactive about it if people are listening to this and they're in their younger years and they don't want to even in the first place get to that place of being sick in your 50s or however old. Before we get into your gene therapy and exactly how it works, do you have any recommendations after all of the research that you've done that is more on the proactive side that can really help slow down cellular aging? Well, I mean, you know, outside of the gene therapies, mostly what you can do is diet and exercise. Don't smoke, don't drink excessive amounts of alcohol, limit the toxins in your body. Why do you get high? Why do you get drunk? Because it's a toxin. Try to live in a a clean environment, but enjoy your life because enjoying your life is a, a a good health attribute. People who are happy live longer. Now, the problem is, is you're going to get diminishing returns. There is no perfect diet, there is no nutraceutical, and there is no uh, amount of exercise that will keep you from impending death. It's, it, that's not possible. So that would be the point where you bring out the bigger guns and you bring out the gene therapies. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think there is something to be said about like the daily habits that you can stack and become healthier with, which we've talked a lot about on the show. But I do want to dive into gene therapy and your company, BioViva. So for someone listening who has no idea what gene therapy is, like how would you start to explain it? So gene therapy is the editing, the modification, or the addition of genetic material into your cells. It could be put into the cytoplasm. Think of that as maybe the yard around your the house on your property. Or it could be put into the nucleus and become part of the transcriptional process of the cell. And the nucleus, think of that as your house. And so what we do is we do uh, gene therapy delivery. So we deliver genes to the nucleus of cells that then transcribe alongside the genes in your chromosomes. So in your house of your cell or your nucleus is where your chromosomes are set. And they code for everything about you, what you look like. Uh, some people say how you behave and, and, a, and a bunch of other things. And so when we add genes that transcribe proteins that help the cells behave more youthfully, that is when we sort of change some sort of health outcome for you. So also, you know, this covers things like CRISPR technology, uh, which is the actual editing of the human chromosome and other gene uh, type modifications. So gene therapy is kind of an umbrella of a lot of terms uh, talking about modifying genes. And it's actually, that's one of the things that I love about nature. It's a natural process. So 
a lot of people said, oh my gosh, this sounds so crazy and out there and high tech, but it's actually something that nature does to us all the time. The retroviruses that go around and different viruses that go around basically do the same thing, but they integrate or give you genes that helps your body transcribe their proteins and make more of them. And in this case, we actually take the power of nature and we deliver healthy cells or cells that make people healthier. And today there are 12 approved gene therapies in the United States for disease. Are you tired of generic health advice that doesn't take your unique needs into account? Do you want to gain a deeper understanding of your health beyond the surface level recommendations? I want to talk to you about Inside Tracker's ultimate plan, the answer to your personalized health questions. With comprehensive blood biomarker analysis, it provides tailored insights into your body's needs. The ultimate plan tests up to 48 different blood biomarkers, including ApoB, cholesterol, glucose, magnesium, cortisol, vitamin D, and insulin. This comprehensive analysis extends your lifespan or health span and guides you to a longer and healthier life. Inside Tracker goes beyond generic clinically normal ranges to unveil your body's unique optimal biomarker zones, revealing where you're optimized and where your improvements can be made. They have science back recommendations on nutrition, fitness, and lifestyle, and are all personalized to your body's data, helping you reach optimal biomarker zones and achieve your wellness goals. Now with insulin testing included, you'll have the key to sustained energy and an early warning system for chronic diseases. This is actually really important. High insulin levels can increase the risk of conditions like heart disease, Alzheimer's, type 2 diabetes, obesity, and more. Inside Tracker's measurements and recommendations can help you maintain healthy insulin levels. So, are you ready to control your health in a new and personalized way? This is the test that I do every few months, and I am obsessed with it. And I change my healthy habits and my nutrition and my supplements based off of this data. You can go to insidetracker.com slash biohacking with Brittany, and you will get 20% off. You can use my discount code biohacking Brittany. It's linked on my website and linked in the show notes. So definitely check that out if you want to do an at-home blood biomarker test that looks at over 48 different biomarkers for you so that you can start optimizing your health today. Wow. Yeah. It is it is really becoming popular. So you take the genes, I guess, from other people and then you insert it into the patient. Is that correct? Yeah. These are sequenced genes. So we don't have to cut them out of another human. The amino sequences are known. And so they are basically put together for you, but they do originally come, yes, from humans. Yeah. Okay. I was just trying to like understand kind of what that was looking like, because I know, like you said, there are like ethical discussions around this and considerations, but if they're sequenced, then I guess that is less of an issue, I guess. Yeah, we don't have to take someone's cells and take the and cut their genes out. There, there are gene banks, and that's where the genes come from. So, yeah, there's no killing of anything in the gene therapy space. Yeah, yeah. And you've personally gone through gene therapy yourself and and had positive results. Can you share your experiences and the impact that has been on your own health? Yeah. So in 2013, when my son was diagnosed and I went looking for curative medicine, we found a couple of candidates that were super powerhouses. One gene was called folostatin, or still is, and it increases muscle mass. And it was being used in clinical studies for Becker's muscular dystrophy and Duchenne's muscular dystrophy in children. And so it had a safety and efficacy profile. It had been all the way through non-human primates and animal testing, and then through safety and efficacy. And the the promise of that sort of gene to be around for children with different muscle uh, disorders and for an aging population who lose muscle mass. So it's natural process that we lose muscle mass as we age. And eventually that leads to something called sarcopenia. That's when it becomes clinical. You become frail, you fall down, you break your hip, and you're basically at end of life care. But increasing muscle mass does something else. It, in, it um, increases insulin sensitivity, and that helps fight metabolic disorder, things like type 2 diabetes, 
So this is kind of a powerhouse of a gene. And in every animal study, because remember, humans are really long lived. So knowing what will happen in a human will take decades of research. But in every animal study, including non-human primates, they actually lived longer. So we did a, a study at Rutgers University with Fulistatin in 2018, 2019. And the, the mice, the, we used old mice, and they lived 32% longer. So the second gene that I took was called, is called telomerase reverse transcriptase. It is a gene responsible for the enzyme that lengthens the caps at the ends of the chromosomes called telomeres. When these caps shorten, we get what's called genomic instability. One of the side effects is mitochondrial issues, mitochondrial dysfunction, which is another hallmark of aging. And basically, when our telomeres are critically short, you're conceived at about 1,500 base pairs and you die, uh, not 1,500, 15,000. And when you are diagnosed with end-stage disease, you have about 5,000 base pairs. And that's known. It's, it's known in the literature. As a matter of fact, the people who vastly died from COVID all had short telomeres in their immune cells, their T lymphocytes. And so what happens is when these telomeres get short, cells can't divide. And we have a really beautiful system. We have a biological system in which when it gets damaged, it repairs itself. And that's kind of amazing, really. And But when these telomeres are short, the body cannot repair itself. Or in the case of infectious disease, if the telomeres are short in the immune cells, if you have immune senescence, your immune cells can't divide and fight the infection. So these at the time uh, when I was looking for curative medicine for kids were the two most promising gene therapies that might help humans live healthier longer. And so in 2015, we started the company BioViva with the idea that we would test the first human subject to see how these therapies worked. I took the gene therapies later that year. And the rest is kind of history. I mean, at that time, we knew how folostatin would work. Telomerase reverse transcriptase had never been used in a human. So we didn't know what would happen. There was a lot of hypothesis that something bad would happen. I can't remember his name, but I met Bill Clinton's scientific advisor and he said, oh, you'll be dead in months. And one of my advisors, when we finally called them and told them, because we didn't tell the advisors of the company that we were going to do it, one quit. And another one said he gave me 13 days to live. And I came back and said, well, I'll live 16 just to mock you. And, and actually, the gene therapy worked as we had hoped that it would work, but not as well as we had hoped it would work. So what we saw was lengthening in the telomeres, MIT lymphocytes, which is the test that is most validated for measuring telomeres. We saw increased muscle mass, and this was all within six months. I had a remission of kidney pain that I had previously had, but I don't have any documentation on the evidence of that. I just, I mean, I just went into a healthier, happier state, lower triglycerides, lower blood glucose. And we, we had no idea how important this was or what the backlash would be to doing this because here I had used my own body as a test subject, but the rest of the world kind of went into a state of shock. Yeah. I mean, it's a really bold move. Like it is, right? Like you're completely betting on yourself for your company, you know, your mother, like you have these responsibilities and you said, like, I trust this enough and I'm going to do this. Like, do you support me? And it's pretty remarkable. Honestly, it is pretty remarkable. And to hear that it really did help you have healthier biomarkers, even six months later, is really impressive. Have you done any more gene therapy since that since that year? Yeah, it, it's actually helped me every year. I've had an improvement in about five years in, in 2020, I did the gene therapies again and added two new gene therapies, Clotho and PGC1-alpha. And yeah, it was like, I thought here we had done something that the whole scientific world could look at. We, we opened my data to any university that wanted to look at it. We, we made everything available. We ended up releasing a peer-reviewed paper in 2021 20, or 22. 
and about the results of the telomeres and the world vastly just was like, wait a minute, are you allowed to do that? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Is this allowed? Is this legal? (laughs) Yeah. And actually, we weren't sure that it was. And so it was important that we didn't do it in the United States. So, you know, I had gone to uh, extreme lengths to make sure that we didn't ruffle any feathers. And um, actually, I was just asked some questions by someone in the media the other day. They said, oh, the FDA went up against you. Well, they know that, of course, they didn't do that. We never got a notice from the FDA. We're actually trying to work with the FDA to get drugs approved. And I don't speak against the the US FDA. I do speak for pre-regulatory routes to help terminally ill patients get access. But I don't speak against the systems that exist. So don't believe everything you read. I think think sometimes people don't realize that the story is so cool that you don't have to make things up around it to make it cooler. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah, that's a great way to put it. For me, uh, oh, sorry, I just wanted to add, I mean, I don't think that it is a thing that just anyone would go out and do. Now, a lot of people have done it since I have did it. There is a big interest in doing that now, but my son suffers with a chronic condition and it's a reminder every day. And these gene therapies had the promise to change the world for everyone. So it wasn't if we were going to do it. We really had to do it. And I was surprised that somebody didn't do it before us. I mean, I was really, really shocked that these gene therapies hadn't been put into clinical trials outside of muscular dystrophy. The evidence is there that there is better technology that should have been available to humans some 15 years ago. And I'm still kind of, every day I'm upset that people are not getting access. One of my favorite game-changing supplements that got released this year is Fatty 15, which is just changing how we see essential fatty acids. C15, the first essential fatty acid discovered in over 90 years, is at the heart of Fatty 15. This science-backed award-winning supplement is setting a new standard for long-term health and wellness. Imagine reversing cellular aging, achieving whole body and mind health, Fatty 15 offers three times more cellular benefits than omega-3, targeting and reversing the core of how we age. If you value omegas for your hormonal health like I do, Fatty 15 is a revelation for menstrual well-being. It's the breakthrough that we've all been waiting for. But there's a lot of other benefits just other than the hormones. It is more than a supplement. It is a lifestyle game changer. Say goodbye to those days of feeling sluggish and hello to a renewed sense of vitality. Whether you're an athlete looking to optimize your performance or someone simply aiming to improve your overall well-being, or maybe you're also interested in longevity and anti-aging, Fatty 15 is definitely for you. This is one of the best supplements I discovered this year, and I am so, so thankful that I did. You can use my link in the show notes to to get a discount off of Fatty15. They don't have any discount codes, so you have to use my link if you want to save. And I highly suggest you do so and add this to your stack of supplements today. Why do you think that that's the case? Like, why do you think there weren't companies or, or more people exploring this? Like, why the lack of movement on it? I think that there's just there's different models for making money. And I, I'm sad about it every day. I, I, I really don't know. But the, the uh, small biotech companies with this most promising technology sit with our hands out to the private industry. The, the government should be funding these technologies. They should be pushing them through as fast as they push through the vaccine. We have to ask the private industry for money. Everyone's asking the pi- private industry for money. Think about it. We can't even get to space now without private industry. I don't know what's happening, but we need to put a lot more emphasis on this. People need to demand access and demand funding of these technologies. Grants tend to fund basic research and they fund the same type of research over and over. We need to get these two people. And it's too expensive for most biotech companies. It's called the valley of death. You have an idea and then you have to get to phase one. But guess what? There's millions of dollars worth of animal studies that don't even predict how well a drug will work in a human. 
So right now it costs about $2.6 billion to get one drug approved. And yet 94% of drugs fail in phase three. And that is because they're all tested in animals that are not humans. So we need to have a pre-regulatory system in which once a drug is shown just basically safe is used in the patients who need it most so that we can start expediting dr these drugs to humans. It, it's just, it's really quite sad for a company to have to raise tens of millions of dollars on data that doesn't even tell you how well a drug will work in humans. Most companies go out of business. Yeah, no kidding. That's a very intense and like a constant uphill battle that you're facing. Is it mostly, I guess, the ethical issues of doing testing and research on human participants? Like, is that the reason why that it's mostly animals? Yeah, yeah. It, uh, President Biden uh, signed into law last December that animal models were no longer required, but the US FDA doesn't have a way around the animal models right now, so they still are required. Yeah, it is a way to try to de-risk the medicine, but a bunch of the products like penicillin and aspirin and other products that we have that we use regularly in society would never have passed animal models by the way, and they they are literally especially in the case of penicillin, responsible for the survival of millions of people at this point. So we need a better way to, to move forward. And, and the gene and cell technology is a very exacting sort of technology. So when you think of a, a drug that you commonly take that someone gives you in the form of a pill, you know, you take that in by mouth typically, and it might really damage your liver and your kidneys, but have some sort of, let's say, effect on a marker. I mean, we've all watched TV, right? And the drug company comes up and they've got this drug will treat psoriasis, but you know, you may die. Like the list of side effects. I mean, I'd rather have psoriasis, right? And, but gene therapy in the case of it, your cells become the drug factory for regulating the protein. And so, and we're only putting in a gene that codes for a protein that is exactly what we want. So it really turns medicine kind of on its head. Yeah, it does. And it's like you said earlier, like it's such a game like disruptor that I'm sure there's just extra roadblocks because people are like, what is this? What does this mean? What does this mean for humanity, for sickness? Like there's all of these bigger questions that you kind of have to figure out, which is not easy for, for you know, a startup or a small company. So right now with your gene therapy, like you've done this for yourself. Are there other people who are volunteering to do this or are you just in the research phase and you're not necessarily giving this to humans right now? So we can't actually give it to humans, but we can assess anyone's data. So we always say that if you're going to go out, you're going to run out and use medical tourism to get access to gene therapies, please let our company uh, follow your data because... The only way we can help people faster is by knowing how a technology will work. So there, what's happening, because think of it as the pot boiling over. If you have a lot of money, you've got your own scientific advisors, hell, you might even have your own lab or two, and you know about these technologies, you know about these gene therapies, you've seen the, the profile, they, they haven't been in a lot of people but the impact, they haven't hurt anyone. And the benefits seem to be across the board. You're just going to go get it. You're, you're not going to wait for a regulatory system to maybe in 20 years pass the, the drug for, for dementia. And then, then maybe you can find a doctor that will use it off-label at a larger amount so your whole body is treated. You're, if you have the wherewithal, you're just going to go get it. And that's what's going to happen to all of medicine. And so that's why I'm working with Best Choice Medicine. It's a pre-regulatory regulatory body that helps different countries bring in new laws and have committee oversight, global committee oversight, so that people who are terminally ill or have no other treatment for their condition can get access to these new technologies and we can have accountability for those technologies. And this is something we'd like to do in every state of the United States and every government in the world. Let's talk about getting the remarkable benefits of fasting without the daunting commitment of long-term fasting. 
As a dedicated professional, always on the lookout for ways to enhance my health and well-being, I've explored intermittent fasting extensively. And if you're a listener of the podcast, you know this. However, I've often found myself pushing the boundaries and experiencing adverse effects such as sleep issues and energy slumps and also hormonal issues. While intermittent fasting did offer some positive outcomes initially, like many of us, I struggled to incorporate it long-term without it really disrupting my daily life. However, my life has recently taken a turn for the better, all thanks to Mimeo. This is the world's first biomimetic supplement. This incredible innovation is the accumulation of years of rigorous clinical research meticulously designed to replicate the effects of a 36-hour fast at the cellular level, which is wild. With Memeo, I can now experience the holistic benefits of fasting without enduring prolonged periods of hunger and deprivation. Are you intrigued about the benefits? Let's get into it. First and foremost, Mimeo activates your cell's innate regenerative capabilities, much like fasting itself. This translates to optimized metabolism and better control over hunger, which a lot of us really value if we're trying to watch our weight. Secondly, it significantly boosts energy levels and accelerates recovery, making it an absolute game changer for active individuals like myself. Thirdly, Mimeo elevates mood and sharpens mental clarity, enabling us to be at our absolute best every single day. I definitely notice this, especially when I take it right before work in the mornings. The icing on the cake is that Mimeo's formulation is exclusively derived from molecules naturally produced by our own body. This means it is very, very safe because it is in perfect harmony with our biological system, delivering optimal effectiveness. Still not convinced? Mimeo offers a 100% happiness guarantee. That's right. There's absolutely nothing to lose. So for all of my fantastic listeners out there, if you want to give Mimeo a try and add it to your supplement stack, I really suggest you do so. And you can do that by using my discount code biohackingbrittany for 10% off for the first three months of your subscription, which is awesome. Join me along with countless others who are on the path to revolutionizing their health with Mimeo. Bid farewell to the challenges of long-term fasting and usher in a healthier, happier version of yourself, which we always love. Thank you for listening. And always remember, when it comes to optimizing your health, Mimeo holds the key. Visit their website, link to my show notes and on my website as well, and embark on your journey towards a better you now. Yeah, I hear you. And I think that's really important and something that's honestly overlooked a lot. I'm curious about the medical tourism aspect that you were talking about, if people are like just going down this rabbit hole and decide they want to do this, what countries are they doing it in? And what what does the price point look like? What is that even like, I've never looked into this, so I have no idea. How do people go about doing this just on their own accord? Well, you have to find a company uh, that does work in the space. And then you basically then would work with a doctor uh, who could work in a country that would allow that by consent. And there are many countries in the world, there's actually even European countries that allow consensual use of medicine. So it's, I wouldn't be an expert on that. I have done some research on it, but it seems to be more available all over the world. And there's even a country uh, that hopefully by the end of the year will sign into law the ability to use these technologies again with committee oversight. So the ability to access them is going to become uh, more and more. How much they cost, they're very expensive. So gene therapies can cost from $25,000 and go up to over a million. But let me put that into, into your mind in a different way. When we look at the 12 regulated gene therapies in the United States, the cheapest gene therapy in the United States is for one eye, and it's $450,000. If you went to medical tourism, you could probably get that for $70,000. So still, it's expensive, but it's at a fraction of the cost. And when we look at treating biological aging, we're looking at the biggest medical unmet market. So therefore, these should become very affordable. They could become $2,000. They might become free by countries actually offering them to their citizens so that they don't have the high cost of disability. 
And so the projection is kind of like the, from supercomputer to cell phone that we will eventually, probably in shorter order than you think, have the ability to disseminate these type of technologies at a fraction of the cost. So gene therapies are different. So why would one be so expensive and one be less expensive? Number one, you might just be treating an organ. You might be just treating your kidney or your liver or your eyes. The other reason is that some genes have proteins that are shared throughout your body. And sorry if I sound a little chilly, my windows are open because it's, what is it, November and my windows are open because there's painting going on in my house. But okay, so some gene therapies have genes that share their protein in your blood. And therefore, you can literally just take a shot in the arm or your bum or something like that, and it will share a protein that will benefit your entire body. Some genes were not so lucky. So unfortunately, one of the biggest powerhouses of treating biological aging, it it treats the most of the hallmarks of biological aging out of all of those. And the hallmarks of aging are the things that are happening at the cellular level that are targets for these therapies. So we don't have therapies to reverse all the hallmarks of aging yet, sadly, but we are working on it, okay? So when we're able to reverse all of aging, then you're really gonna know. But we do have technologies that can target some hallmarks of aging and probably help people live healthier by over decade. And telomerase reverse transcriptase is one of those superpower genes, but it doesn't share its protein outside of the cell that has the gene. So today's gene therapy, we can't target every cell on the body. And so this is a therapy you'd probably have to take once every two to five years and layer it into your system. And it becomes more cost prohibitive because you have to take larger amounts of the gene therapy. And so Most of the cost comes from a manufacturer of a gene therapy, and that's where it is. So it's not like a small molecule where you can make a whole pile of powder for pennies on the dollar. Gene therapy, just making it for one person, uh, takes about 16 weeks. And you could also, you could make it for 10 or 100 people in those 16 weeks. You'd make it in larger scale, but it takes a long time. And It's a very precise product and it can't have any bacterial components. So if anything goes wrong with the therapy, they have to start all the way over again. So it's pretty, it's a pretty high level technology that takes experts to build it. So that's where the costs come from in these therapies. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. Like just the enormous amount of research behind all of it, but also just implementing it on a practical level when you can actually start administrating it. Like that in itself is just such a big task to figure out how to do. And like you said, like it's different depending on the gene that you do as well. I'm curious if you're going to, like, I know you're focused on aging and also like helping heal kids' diseases, which I think is really important. Would you ever look outside of that scope at like a gene such as like MTHFR, which a lot of people have variations of, which really impacts like their methylation pathways and inflammation and things like that. Oh yeah, absolutely. So those are all candidates for longevity. So DNA methylation is a big issue. As you know, Altos was built around looking at the epigenetics and trying to restore them probably by a small molecule and not a, a gene therapy. But there are genes that are cell regulators. And so, yeah, these are definitely candidates. Different candidates might be around not just epigenetics, but removing glycation end products, helping the cells break down proteins, especially misfolded proteins better. These are all sort of the superpowers, you know, making each one of your little cells into a a superpower ecosystem to support your body will just make healthier, more fortified people. Yeah, absolutely. So in, let's say like 30 years from now, what would your ideal picture be of gene therapy in the US? What does it look like in terms of who has access to it? And also how robust is the different types of genes ideally at at that point in time that we could have access to? 
So in 30 years, I mean, you can do a lot of exponential jumps in this technology in a perfect world. So in a perfect world, in 30 years, there are a multitude of gene therapies being used as immunizations against aging uh, that also help with repair for people who are already suffering from aging. Our company is a specialist in combinatorial gene therapy. So Our platform is CMV Gene Therapy Delivery because it delivers more gene product than the gene therapy deliveries today. So we'd hope to be licensing out a myriad of different beneficial gene therapies in which are like precision medicine. So let's say that you were born with hemophilia A, but you also don't want to die of biological aging. So, you know, we would put one of the factor, there's the the factor eight and nine and 10 genes for hemophilia we'd put in the correct uh, gene. And then we would also do a correction for probably your biggest, uh, your shortest fuses of aging. So if you have a a family, family history of mitochondrial dysfunction, or let's say metabolic disorder, holding too much weight, type two diabetes, liver failure, you know, we would fortify you with beneficial genes there. But then we would also treat you with the, the genes like telomerase reverse transcriptase and fullostatin and clotho and PGC1 alpha and FGF21 and all these other candidates that just help you live healthier longer and having a better repair system. So, you know, the hope is to have like a, a precision medicine when we look at your genome, we know what you need and we keep you healthy rather than letting you get sick. And you, and you would probably see a big bump in optimal health at any rate, and people would be treated young, younger than they are now. So you might not want to use fullostatin when someone's 20 because they'd really muscle up, <laughs> but you, you would definitely want to uh, do it by the time they're 35. So there'd probably be a schedule much like immunizations, you know, with infants, how they have that whole thing. But this would be actually preventative medicine. And then hopefully when you walk in a room, uh, if we've had great success by 2030, you might have people of lots of different chronological ages, but they would biologically look about the same. So you might not know how old somebody is walking in the room. And that's not about aesthetics. That is literally survival and health. So keeping your skin youthful, the biggest protective organ of your body, your liver and everything else actually has a visual effect. And so hopefully, and then people just fall into time. People will say, oh, well, what would I do with the extra health? Well, I mean, if you even have to ask, I'm surprised, but people will be doing multitude of careers. They'll be contributing more to society and and having more of a value impact. And hopefully, because lifespan will be, and health span will be so much better that, you know, things like war and things like that would just be considered an an atrocity. It already is, but uh, clearly it's not atrocious enough to stop us. (laughs) Seriously. Oh, I I love that vision. I, it's so inspiring and it would be so cool to be able to witness that and be a part of that. And also for you to be able to lead that and be one of the people who is making such a difference in everyone's health is just remarkable. So Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This was so enlightening. If people want to reach out to you or learn more about gene therapy and what you're doing, where can they do that and how can they find you? Um, They could go to bioviva-science.com. That's our our website. We're on social media all over the place. I do conferences and always come out and say hi and and if I have a, you know, as long as I'm not pressed to, to go on to the next thing, I, I love talking to people and, and learning about their story. And mostly, you know, I just want you and the listeners to live long enough to see this beautiful future and to remember that our bodies are full of trillions of cells. Please take care of them. But the most important cell that we depend on is the planet. You can think of it as a cell as well. And so take care of your environment and the creatures in it and yourself. And I hope to see you on the other side of 2045. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much for coming on. This was just so great. Thanks for listening to another episode of Biohacking with Brittany. If you're interested in finding the show notes or the sponsors for this episode, you can do so on my website, which is biohackingbrittany.com. 
Remember to follow me on Instagram where I'm most active. My handle is at biohackingbrittany. And if you're interested in working together and you want to email me directly, you can do that. My email is info at biohackingbrittany.com. And I look forward to hearing from you and having you tune in next week.